Hi, I'm Aaron Ra, and you're listening to Catholic versus Atheist. So just tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, if you would, please, who you are, what you believe, and how you came to believe what you believe. Okay, well, I don't like to refer to it as beliefs. I mean, if I say that I believe something, it means that I think that this is what is most likely true, or is at least mostly true, but I don't actually know that. That's what distinguishes a belief. It's when you think something's true, but you can't know it because you can't demonstrate it. Whereas believers often claim to know things no one even can know. And uh, they, when they say the word believe, it is very often with the word make hyphenated in front of it. So make believe. So that it's, it seems to be, you know, that the, the word means pretend in some way. So I don't like to, I don't like to mix the concept. And as far as what my position is, uh, it's not just that I see no evidence of there being a God. I see substantial evidence that all of our concepts are God's came from relatively primitive uh, initial ideas of, of, you know, superior people or people with magic powers that have then transcended to become magic imaginary friends. And that that is all there ever was to it. And uh, as far as, uh, you know, any denomination, you, you identify as Catholic, which is an interesting conversation itself, especially in recent years. But I don't like to specify my attacks against a particular denomination or even a particular religion. My problem is religion in total, and it's not necessarily even religion. My problem is faith. Faith is the most dishonest position it is possible to have. The only way to make faith less honest is to be an apologist for faith. So uh, before we jump into all that exciting stuff, let's talk a little bit about you. Who are you? How were you raised? Where were you raised? Just talk about biographical details, please. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I am currently, I mean, uh, I am the original director for American Atheists and author of Foundational Falsehoods of Creationism, which has done very well on Amazon and is uh, very highly rated. And as far as my perspective, I think it was to my advantage that I was raised in a predominantly Mormon culture. Uh, most of my family are Mormon or what they called Jack Mormons because nobody knows what a creed is. They've never cracked open a Bible. They don't know anything religious at all, but they're all better than me because despite all their felony convictions, chemical addictions and everything else, they can claim that, you know, they're Christian, so they're better than me. And what does Christian mean? Well, that means that they call themselves Christian. That's what that means. And, and that's all that that means. And the rest of the family, of course, it goes right down to the magic underwear and all of that kind of crap. <laughs> You know, I mean, where they hear the prophet say that no Mormon will ever be elected president of this country, so they go out and vote for Mitt Romney anyway. The hell? Did you just conveniently forget what your prophet said? <laughs> but, the, but the advantage that I had in being raised, you know, by, by Mormons, I never identified as Mormon myself because I did the only wise thing anybody should do, is which is not assume that your parents' religion is your religion. But here in Texas, people don't know the difference. They think they're born into the Republican Party. Literally, they, they say that. They, they, they actually use the words that the party they're born into and thus owe allegiance to the Republican Party, the party of their forefathers, the party they were born into. Seriously. So any, anyway, but you know, people are irrational. And, and politics is easily, easily as irrational as a religion. And possibly more irrational than religion. But the reason that I say that it was an advantage was uh, when I was living, let's say, in the Four Corners area, you know, Utah, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado. I just named five states. That were <laughs> four <in that. laughs> but, you know, living in that area, it's, it is predominantly Mormon. You know, Mormons own and control everything there. And, and there's little small towns in that area that if you're not Mormon, you're not employed. So you need to move someplace else where they will hire non-Mormons. And we ended up moving to uh, Los Angeles when I was a kid. And that's when I got to experience Christian denomination bigotry, you know, hatred against other denominations. And anyone professing to be a Catholic has got to know all about that because you're not even true Christians. You're just the majority of Christians, which has always made me laugh. I mean, if, the, if, if all of the Protestants say that Catholics are not true Christians, well, you, then you are no longer the dominant religion, are you? Because if over half of you are Catholic and they're not true Christians, well, that makes you the fifth largest religion, just above Sikhs, that there are more Hindus than there are true Christians in this world. So Islam is the dominant religion, followed by Catholicism. <laughs> <laughs> and then dropping down to Hinduism and then Christianity, if that's the way they want to work it. But as I said, it's completely irrational, so that nobody ever actually thinks any of these things through. 
when they say, well, Christianity is not a religion, it's a philosophy. Bullshit. It's the dominant religion. <laughs> a religion is a faith-based belief system holding or positing the notion that some essence of self somehow survives the death of the physical body to continue on in some other form. If you are part of a faith-based belief system positing that idea, that is a religion. If you worship your favorite football team, that is not a religion. That's a different problem you have. <laughs> <laughs> I've just discovered uh, Leo Messi, Lionel Messi. I have not discovered that person yet. Okay, well, when you do, you will see the light. Okay. But I'm not a sports fan, but I just fell in love with this one soccer player because he's so good. And this brings me to the notion of God. The reason I love God is because he's so good. What's your counter argument against that? The fact that he's nothing but evil without any redeeming features whatsoever. <laughs> So we're not talking about the same guy here. I mean, Isaiah 45, 5, 6, and 7 spells it out right there. And we're done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you're using some private judgment here. <laughs> Am I? Yeah. What the fuck did God do that wasn't evil? <laughs> Everything he does is good. He never does evil. Where is evil. the exception to all of the evil he does in the Bible? He's incapable of ever committing any evil ever. Oh, then, then the Bible's written about somebody else then. Well, you need to interpret the Bible. So it was somebody else who killed millions of people for making too much noise. It was somebody else who blew up a town because they weren't righteous enough. Because God's weird judgment is that the only people in both of those situations, both in the global flood and in the destruction of Sodom, the only guy righteous enough, graded on a curve to be saved, is the drunk who sodomized his own kids. That's the guy in both instances. That's the only guy worthy of being saved. That's how I used to see Noah too, but now Noah is one of my favorite patriarchs. I'm playing the role of Noah to you. So I say get into the ark, meaning the Holy Roman Catholic Church. Get in while you still have time. You don't know how much time you've got left. So just get in. That's what I say to you. What do you say? I have to wonder how it was that if you were born into a Catholic family and raised to be Catholic all your life. How could you still be Catholic now? I wasn't born and raised Catholic. So what's your excuse? It's got to be even worse. <laughs> yeah. I came to God through philosophy, and then I took a leap of faith into religion. Okay. So two wrong answers in one. That's good. <laughs> uh, so, so, so philosophy, to my experience, is, is something that is grossly misused, especially when it applies to religion, or whenever it is applied to religion, it's misused. And then anything that any belief that requires faith should be rejected for that reason, because faith is autodeceptive, has absolutely no way of determining the truth about anything, but it's a great way of staying wrong forever and never realizing it. James Randi had a million dollar challenge for 20 years for anybody to demonstrate anything from the supernatural. And he had lots of people come to him convinced, thoroughly convinced that they could demonstrate their supernatural powers. I can demonstrate the supernatural to you in two minutes. Do you have freedom of your will? If so, you believe in the supernatural. Well, no, no. Uh, actually, if I were to believe in the supernatural, I would not be able to believe in free will because your theology prohibits free will. No, it doesn't. Yeah, yeah it absolutely does. It logically does. And nobody understands this because religious believers don't think logically. But if somebody is supposed to know your future and God knows everything that we're going to do and he's able to calculate every contingency for everything anybody ever wants to do and still know your future, then you don't have free will. You can't change what you're going to do. He already knows what you're going to do. So there's Knowledge no is not cause. I can know what you're going to do without being the cause of what you do. But he doesn't have to be the cause of it. And if he knows what you're going to do, then he knows what you're going to do before you do. So you can't not do the thing that he knew you were going to do. You have no free will. In a world where prophecy can exist and be fulfilled, free will cannot exist. They cancel each other what out. What about the prophecy in Nineveh of Jonah where he said, if you don't repent, then your city is going to be destroyed. And then they repented and the city was not destroyed. Jonah complained to God. He said, look, you made me look like a fool. You made me prophesy. And my prophecy didn't come true. And God said, well, it's because they changed their ways. So God can't see the future then. Oh, he sees everything. So, so God said that this was going to happen. He tells the prophet, the prophet says it, then it doesn't happen. And God tells the guy, well, see, it didn't happen because they changed their way. So prophecy doesn't work. So either prophecy doesn't work or free will doesn't work. Because, I mean, Ezekiel obviously didn't know what real true prophecy was. He failed at everything. Isaiah failed at everything too. That's not what the church teaches. 
I know because the church teaches lies. The church does not teach truth. The truth is what the facts are. The church isn't interested in that. The church is teaching philosophy incorrectly to dupe people into believing and then paying out their tithes. So are you happy with a natural first cause, which is uncaused? Or do you have an infinite regress of natural causes? What do you mean? I believe that there is an uncaused first cause. That's my God, okay? Okay, well, can I correct you on that? Sure. Okay, so there's not an uncaused first cause. If there was an uncaused first cause, it wouldn't be a God, because God is way more complicated. No, he's perfectly simple. What, what? He's perfectly simple. Don't interrupt. Don't interrupt here. <laughs> the, the, the explanation where people want to go from simple to complex, they want to produce this more complex thing than the simple beginning. The more complex thing would be the God that they've imagined. That. However, at the same time, my friends who do cosmology say there's no beginning to the universe. There is no first cause necessary. But if there was then it would be a, possibly uh, a, an influx from a multiverse that just expands our, our universe just like it would hundreds of millions of others. Your appeal to physics and cosmology saying that there was a multiverse before this universe just pushes the problem back one level. Well, so does God. In neither case do we get the uncaused first. Well, in your case, you get a uncaused first cause being the eternal God. But as Sagan brilliantly put it, well, if you're going to put that in, why not skip a step and just say that the universe was eternal, which is what the cosmologists are now saying. Because the universe is subject to change. Yes. And an effect cannot be more perfect than its cause. Do you admit to that principle? An effect cannot be more perfect than its cause? Absolutely, yes. It's a product of emergence. So it starts from very simple. It doesn't start from super complex and then get simple. It starts very simple and becomes more complex because we're talking about the principle of emergence, which is emergence complexity. Do things in nature tend to order or do they tend to disorder? Tell me. In biology, they tend to order. Right. But in general, overall, in the in big picture. In general, in biology, they tend to order. In the big order. picture. In the big picture of biology, they tend to order. And how big is the picture of biology in the history of the universe? for what we know of this planet so far. Don't dance around the issue. Just tell me honestly. I'm not dancing around it. I'm answering the question. You keep re-asking the typical creationist trope of misunderstanding what the second law of thermodynamics is. But biology does not refute that. It's simply that this is not a closed system. Biology gets its energy from the sun. So it's not a closed but system. But are we or are we not reverse entropy machines? reverse entropy machines. Well, that's not the way I would put it, but yeah. Biological life is reversing entropy, correct? How? By organizing. Things tend to disorder in the universe. Okay, so when McDonald's began with one simple store and is now turned into this massive corporation spreading around the world. That, that required reverse entropy. That required reverse entropy, okay. Of course. This is basic science. I can't believe you How you're... is the corporation at McDonald's basic science? No, entropy is basic science. If you don't know that reverse entropy is what... Of course I do, as I was just explaining, because you hadn't mentioned the second law before I did. But you're trying to obfuscate this thing by saying, let's only I'm talk about... Yes, you I'm are. I'm not the one trying to obfuscate You're anything. trying to say, let's focus only on biology, but biology is by definition the realm, the only realm of reverse entropy. You know, as we just explained, the corporation of McDonald's is another example. There is no corporation of McDonald's without biological life. Don't try to slip that past me. I'm not trying to slip anything past you. You are. The, you the are. The misunderstanding of the second law of thermodynamics that creationists always cite is they want everything, they, they want nothing, nothing to be able to get more complex than it started out. No. But the fact is that we, since we get our energy from the sun and it's not a closed system, then all their arguments for entropy fail. You must be talking to a bunch of morons. Every day, all day, yes. I talk, <laughs> yeah. I, I talk to creationists. All biological life reverses entropy. That's the whole point. We cannot have a natural first cause. We cannot. Yes, we can. In one sense or another, it'll still be natural. So you believe in an eternal universe? Yes. No beginning? Yes. Okay. As I already told you before, cosmologists are now saying that it, it has no beginning in that sense. You can appeal to any authority you want, but doesn't mean I need to agree with you. I don't need to appeal to authority. You have been appealing to authority. I don't specialize in cosmology. I have to trust what the scientists tell me on that. And then I give a number of options of possibilities that are not necessarily declared by those scientists, but by according to my own study. So I'm not appealing to any authority. Okay, so we, I think we've exhausted this particular tangent. Do you want to talk about the morality of God and the morality of the church again? 
the character in the story that is God did nothing to warrant being called love or wisdom or any of the other accolades that are heaped upon him. The Bible is not the work of a superior being. This was the work of ignorant primitives pretending to speak for a God. No superior being, certainly not a supreme being, would allow any association with the Bible. I was a 12-year-old when I tried to read the Bible. I didn't even, I, I think I might have gotten out of Genesis before I threw the book across the room in disgust. And I had a, I offered a prayer when I still believed in God that he, he had better explain himself. <laughs> because that the, the way the Bible describes him is just, that's, that's not a thing to be worshipped. This is not a thing that, that I want to be stuck with for all of eternity. You know, and I knew that I was damning myself to hell because I still believed in hell. I was 12. I knew that I was damning myself by, by saying this, you know, when I, when I prayed and said, can I just die? Can I, why would I want to be with something like that? I mean, this is a, this was like a character, like the little Anthony Fremont out of the twilight zone. There's this monster that can wish anything he wants, and he can read your mind, so you better always be thinking pleasant thoughts. And if, you, if he ever does anything horrible, which is all he ever does, then you somehow got to say, oh, that was a good thing that you killed all those people for no reason. That was good, yeah. What do you think that I believe that I should not believe about morality, specifically Catholic teachings about what's right and what's wrong? What do I accept and believe that I should not? <laughs> Where do the Catholics come off claiming to be moral about anything? Aren't they the blackest history in all of religion? I mean, let's just exclude not just in the denominations of Christianity. I mean, not only are they the most evil of all the denominations of Christianity, but on religion as a whole. I mean, they have the, the bleakest history of corruption. Of, of, of Look at all the different popes, it was the, the ones that are you know, transmitting uh, uh, STDs and, and, and raping choir boys and, and all the ones that are admitting that, you know, hey, this, uh, this religion scam is a great way for us to make a ton of cash. You get quotes from all these popes doing this. Right until right, I mean, it's it's not a surprise that we get up to the Hitler youth, who then has to be, you know, went to Darth Ratzinger, who would have to put him off in seclusion someplace for, <laughs> to, for defending the pedophile priests. I mean, like when every parish has to admit having hundreds of pedophile priests, this is not a coincidence. <laughs> okay, this wow. this is a systemic <laughs> problem now. Yeah, I think your problem is hyperbole. <laughs> Do you think that I believe that a creepy old priest raping a young boy is a good thing? Of course not. So why all the jumping up and down? Because you're talking about morality, which kind of excludes Catholicism from the conversation. <laughs> Who's more Catholic for you? The priest who obeys what the church teaches or the priest who disobeys and rapes the young boy? Which one's more Catholic for you? When you have that many pedophile priests, they're not necessarily disobeying. They're actually doing what the whole organization was structured to do. So your true sincere belief, you're not in entertainer mode. You're telling me as a sincere human being that you think that the Catholic Church thinks that pedophilia is good or at least neutral, that it's not evil and that we should protect those who engage in it. Is that what you're saying? They're not saying, hey, pedophilia is good, but they are saying, hey, if you want to rape little boys, we'll help you get away with it. So you tell me, is that good or is that evil? It is evil to condone evil. That's what the church teaches. Then Catholicism is evil. No, the people within the church are evil. We're talking about Cardinal Pell. We're talking about all the higher ups, or we talk about just the priests or the entire collection. Every single sinner is a sinner and every single criminal is a criminal. Okay, so now we have an organization of criminals protecting criminals. Criminals and sinners. Right. What did you think it was? Well, that's exactly what I thought it was. It, it's an organization of criminals protecting criminals. That's what Catholicism is. That's what it is, but that's not all that it is, right? <laughs> what, what, what else can it be that matters? Listen, if you send your son to hockey and he gets molested by the hierarchy in that hockey organization, it's a group of criminals and sinners that are perpetrating that, okay? Or uh, elementary school teachers. Do you know that the percentage of abuse in the church by a priest is lower than in elementary schools? Uh, no, it, I don't think that that can be possible anymore, but given the news reports that we've been seeing just in the last couple of years. And I've seen this going on for, I don't know, 30 years. And now, just in the last couple of years, we're finally seeing higher-ups within Catholicism actually facing charges, actually being taken down. We have an organization that promotes criminality and has a history 
of always having promoted corrupt criminality exclusively that has more evil on their books than any other denomination. And on top of all of this, we now finally get to the culmination where people are all saying, you know what, this, this has been going on for what, 1,500 years? Since the fall. And we're just now noticing it on a national scale? Yeah, there's a willing blindness among criminals and sinners, and there's a willing blindness even among victims. Why do you think people don't come forward for 40 years? It's because they have to process this, right? It's not easy. But evil is evil. It doesn't matter if it's a priest doing it or if it's a high school teacher or a hockey coach. Evil is evil. Right, so so that that makes me wonder, getting into religion, you first have to accept faith. That's not the first step. That's not the first step. No, that would have to be the first step. No, the first step is a rational deduction that I am not the first cause and that God is the first cause, the uncaused cause. I understand. Every argument for God is a logical fallacy, and I could probably name most of them because I keep seeing them all being repeated, and you brought up a couple today. So it is always fallacious thinking. It is a, an irrational position to assume that there is a God. A God is not even possible. It certainly isn't indicated by the evidence. And any time you assume a belief that is not evidently true, that by definition is irrational. So the first thing you have to do is you have to give up skeptical thinking. You have to give up rationalism to assume things on faith. You're already done. You've already crossed a threshold I can't breach. Have you read uh, The Great Intellects of the Catholic Tradition? Is this a comedy show? Yes, it is. <laughs> Haven't you noticed? <laughs> no, but who are the greatest intellects? Who comes to mind when I say the great intellects of the Catholic tradition? Who comes to mind for you? Augustine and Aquinas. Come on. I was going to say Aquinas. And Anselm. Yeah, there's, that's another good example. And although I can't remember Anselm's... Ontological what, what argument. F- yes. That then which nothing greater can be thought. Yeah, so there, we have three different, well, actually four if you throw in Descartes, but there's there's three huge failures in philosophy, and, and they seem to be the foundation of Catholicism, or at least Christianity, and Aquinas is one of those. Do you think that you're smarter than these giants, these intellectual giants? I have to. Wow. I have to, having analyzed their arguments and realized the conclusion they come up with, if this is your math... And you came up with that conclusion? <laughs> yeah, you're an idiot. That's that's where we are. Yes. Yeah, so you're intellectual giants of philosophy, fucking morons. Who can you name me that is above you intellectually, that is wiser, smarter, more intelligent? Uh, I have a number of friends that I think are considerably smarter than me. Household names, though, I want. Okay. Um, one of them would be Matt Dillahunty. <laughs> yeah, I found him a bit rude when I talked to him. He seemed to be like you in as much as he was really, really interested in entertaining his listeners more than just actually being honest. I'm not not saying that you're not honest, but I think you have a a habit of being dramatic and being larger than life. Is that something you've heard before? No, I wouldn't have thought so. Is this you? This is the real you? It's always been the real me, (laughs) yes. (laughs) It's, it's It's all very exaggerated. You know, like every parish, every Catholic parish has hundreds of priests. We're lucky if we have one priest per parish. And you're talking about hundreds of priests per parish. Okay, do, you, do I need to pull up the news stories? Because it would take me a minute to do that. But I can pull up two recent news stories where you have, uh, like this, I think it was the state of Pennsylvania. Oh, a state may have hundreds. 500 pedophile priests just in Pennsylvania. So you made a mistake when you said a parish. A parish is one little local neighborhood church. Well, unless you're in Louisiana, as I started out with, because they use counties. They call them parishes instead of... Ah, uh, okay. Instead of dioceses. Yes. Instead well, of dioceses. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a much bigger group. So, yeah, that's okay. what I was thinking. Okay, okay. So we don't disagree then. I'd like to ask my atheist friends, what is the difference between the best case scenario and the worst case scenario for any human being? Because from my Catholic perspective, there's heaven and hell awaiting each one of us. Why do you believe in hell? Because of morality. That was the first thing I let go of as a child because I realized (laughs) it was impossible. Because of morality, if there are no lasting consequences, it literally does not matter what choices we make. But morality is not the issue. Gullibility is the issue. (laughs) Okay. It doesn't matter how evil you are. All sins will be forgiven if you but believe the unsupported assertions of impossible absurdities sold to you by the priests who don't know what the hell they're talking about. They literally don't know what they're talking about. So gullibility is the sole criteria for redemption. It doesn't matter how good or bad you are. 
I'm a believer, you're a non-believer. What's the lasting consequence for each of us and how do they differ? Is there any difference between my lasting outcome and your lasting outcome? Well, even your Bible, because you remember the, the hell concept didn't come from actual theology. The hell concept that you have now was adopted from Dante's Inferno. <laughs> So, I mean, that, that wasn't even in the scriptures. I mean, you do have that line out of Revelations where Jesus says he himself will be crushing the unbelievers in the bloody wine press. I mean, so he's being a vindictive bastard in that. But we know it's not actually him talking, right? Because only the four Gospels are supposed to purport to talk about what he actually said. Others, like Timothy and them, they're just making up shit that they want Jesus to say. Or, or like in Daniel, where they're just pretending that Jesus said things to them in their dreams so they can manipulate their vision of Elvis working in the 7-Eleven after he died so that they can promote their own ideas as if it was being condoned by God. This is why I think you're a great entertainer, not a great thinker. I understand that you don't think of a great thinker and you still believe something I had to reject when I was 12 because it, it insulted my intelligence as a child. So what is the difference in outcome between you, the genius, and me, the moron? I'm not calling myself a genius. So what is the difference of outcome for you, the relatively smart guy, and for me, the relatively gullible guy? As I started to say, even your Bible talks about what would the real punishment was not going to be in hell, that the punishment is supposed to be done in this life, that God was going to punish people in this life, not in the next one. So... The, the repercussions are equal for both of us. The reasons why we behave in a, in, a, in a manner keeping us out of arrest might be our fear of police and incarceration, or it might be that we, being having evolved as a social species, we have a natural built-in empathy for our family, friends, and fellows. We have compassion for other people. And this is something, well, aberrations occur all the time. Those people tend to be removed from the gene pool. They're either, you know, people who are extremely selfish, have underdeveloped frontal lobes or a lack of mirror neurons or whatever. They just do selfish, compulsive things to benefit themselves. If they're not elected president, then what they might end up doing is uh, being banished or imprisoned or killed. Okay. On principle, what argument can you make to a person like that to change their ways and to be less selfish, given the fact that they have more money than you, they have more women than you, they have more pleasure than you, they have better food than you, and they have... I don't, I don't know. The, 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 the example that keeps coming to mind doesn't have more pleasure or better food <laughs> <laughs> than me. <laughs> I don't think there's anything you could say to that person. What I could say is that you better change your ways and get into the ark, the Catholic Church, or you're going to burn in hell for all eternity. Well, no, we, we, we can say that impeachment and incarceration seem eminent. But you haven't answered my question. What could you say on principle mm -hmm. that would make this person who is sophisticated in his selfishness and is deriving a lot of pleasure more than you from his life? Well, again, no. <laughs> You, you can't limit this to Donald Trump. You have to go with the thought experiment. There's someone more sophisticated out there than Donald Trump, believe it or not. There really is. So stretch your mind. And what could you say to that person? Don't, don't tell me to stretch my mind. I'm aware of lots of people. You keep coming back to Donald Trump. Because it's an amusing example. Yeah, it is. You're an entertainer. So what can you but say? With him and with others like him. In our society, we have a way of dealing with those people. They tend to be ostracized from the rest of the community, either by banishment or by imprisonment or by being killed or what have you. So there's no principle. And that's what ends up happening. And there's a, so there's no principle. In the course of population mechanics, we end up with a preference for people who have more compassion for their humanity. So there's no principle. What do you mean there's no principle? I'm asking you to give this man a principle... Not a stick that says society will curb your behavior. No. Enlighten him okay. with a principle, okay. please. Okay. So the way that I generally put it is that I don't actually hate things. I mean, I, I, I have to confess, I, mean, I hate lies and liars. I really do. And that's, that's the most irritating thing. And that's one of the things that keeps me going. But it is honestly the only thing I hate. So many people around me just hate every damn thing, and I will hear all about everything that they hate. But what, but what I've told people is that nobody gives a damn what you hate. That's not what's going to – that's not what people are going to remember about you, okay? Yeah. Here, here's, here's the thing. I mean, if, if it's the things that you love mm. that endear you in other people's memory. Right. So look, maybe in our in our friendship, you I find that you you love budgies. Maybe you just got a weird <laughs> thing for budgies, whatever it is. You just love them. And so every time I see a budgie, I think of you. That's nice. Now, it's not like when you know, like my neighbor who kept any 10 minute conversation with my neighbor and it always turns into them damn Mexicans. 
Seriously? I, I, have, I have a good friend, a guy I've known for decades, and I warned my wife when he came over that it won't be 10 minutes in our house. He won't be 10 minutes in our house before he blames everything on the liberals. Knowing that I'm a liberal, and he'll ruin dinner, he'll ruin the evening, but this is what this guy's going to do. And it was. He walked in in 10 minutes. He didn't know my wife was a public school teacher, but he threw that in, too, because he hated public school. He hates education because he's stupid. <laughs> so that's why he hates education. So right away, it's them damn liberals and their teachers. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to move to less personal topics now. So it won't be about you being a non-Catholic and me being a Catholic. It'll be about philosophy I'm generally. I'm still curious what? about the Catholic thing. I mean, what could possibly convince you that there would be a God? And if there was a God, why the fuck would you choose the Christian God? And if you're going to choose the Christian God, why the <laughs> fuck would you choose the worst possible encapsulation okay. of that? Uh, instead of trying to convince you that my rationale is reasonable, I don't think that will work, why don't you tell me what danger I'm in by submitting to what you think is an evil and corrupt organization? Uh, I know some people that are working on the, the clergy project, and the clergy project is for priests that have spent their lives at the pulpit, you know, repeating lies, and eventually they realize that they're lying and they don't buy their own bullshit anymore. But they've been so invested in this. They're like professional priests. And what the hell else do you do when you're 40 some odd years old? And this all you've been in is a ministry your whole life. So they end up, they, they go to the clergy project where they often can't even come out. They're, they're often still at the pulpit, still lying to the congregation, knowing that what they're saying is not even true. But they got to do it anyway. But one of the things that we've noticed, one of the psychological factors that we've noticed from people that come out of religious belief is they tend to be more tolerant. And they're more curious. It is like literally a reawakening. Some of them go back to college. Some of them start learning. They, they, they start voting liberally. I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing how all of these, all of these separate factors, they were, they were hateful, homophobic, you know, misogynist, whatever, and, and completely incurious. They don't care what the real answer is. I've had people tell me that if it doesn't directly affect the amount of food, need to know it. But then, they, but then, yeah, I'm serious. And I can't even imagine being like that. But that's the way it seems that common people are. They don't want to discuss anything that is outside of grandpa's memory. And that, was ne that was never my limitation. Yeah. But people, when they come out of the clergy, they do kind of wake up in a number of ways. Yeah, those who are asleep, I have no doubt, wake up. And I'm, I appreciate the uh, work that you're doing if you're involved in that. These people do need to wake up and they do need to leave the clergy. They're a cancer on the church. They need to be purged. And I'm glad that you're helping them the out. The church itself is a cancer. That's not what I believe. The few people getting cured of the problem are not the problem. No, but those who are lying in the pulpit are the problem. And if you can't see that, you're blind. Well, then then we need to get rid of the, all the priests then and not just the ones who know that they're lying. No, if you're preaching the gospel, but you think it's a lie, you are sinning. But the gospel could nonetheless be true. You admit that much? There are many things that could be true that we can't show to be true, but we can't say they're true if we can't show that they're true. Every religion tells two lies. It cites facts that are not facts and pretends to know things nobody knows. Who God is, what he is, and what he wants, and what heaven and hell, all of these are asserted as fact. And you're pretending to know things you don't know. And nobody has a reason to believe. If I'm wrong, then you and I are headed for exactly the same annihilation. But if you're wrong, you're in big trouble. Have you ever burnt your finger? It really hurts. I can't be wrong on this. And you can't be right on this. So you have nothing to worry about. I don't have anything to worry about. You've got the idea of a hell, which if it were real, it would disprove God. No. It, yes. No. If the, uh, yes. No. The idea of having an eternal eternal, 11 jillion years times a factor of 11 jillion years continued on forever of melting your flesh off of your body, letting it regrow and, melt, and melting it back off again, just to cause you as much pain as possible. Why? Because you were too smart to buy the bullshit story for no good reason. You were supposed to believe impossible nonsense for no good reason, and you didn't buy the impossible nonsense. So now the infinite wisdom of loving beneficial goodness is going to have to torture you forever, and you're being judged. You exist only for a spark. There was an eternity in which you didn't exist. There will be an eternity where you don't exist, and you only exist for this spark. And you're given this choice. Do you accept 
only provisionally what you can determine to be true, like an honest person? Or will you believe impossible nonsense for no good reason? Well, you chose rational belief, so now we're going to have to punish you forever and no, ever and the ever. The problem is not in the intellect. You'll never get punished for the intellect. It's the will. You don't have good will. What if I only have good will? We're talking about me now, right? If you only have good will, you go to heaven. That doesn't make any sense. Well, what do you want to go to hell? Because I don't believe in God, and I blasphemed against the Holy Ghost. Are you asking what my perspective is? My Catholic perspective is that if you only have good will, then you go to heaven, period. Where is that written? That's Catholic dogma. Without ill will, there is no possibility of sin. Where is that written? It's the definition of sin. The definition of sin is having ill will. That's the definition of sin. You choose a lower good over a higher good, and you'd make that willful choice. Oh, I thought sin was when you violate God's law. Because, you know, when you look up the definition of sin... It's a violation of whatever is attributed to God's law. So if you don't keep the Feast of Weeks, then you're a sinner in violation of God's law. Which religion is this? Yours. So I need to keep the Feast of Weeks according to the Jewish tradition? It's one of the Ten Commandments, yes. You're interpreting the Ten Commandments for me, and I don't submit, I don't bow to your authority. I bow to the authority of Pope Francis, right? I, well, I thought it was Jesus, because Jesus said that you had to obey every jot and tittle of all those old Mosaic laws. Yeah, I have to obey everything according not to your interpretation, but according to the interpretation of the Vicar of Christ, the Holy Father, the Pope, right? You're, you're not the Pope. If you were the Pope, then I would probably not be Catholic, right? <sighs> <laughs> what, what, what? It's like George Carlin said. He he said, "I have just as much authority as the, as the Pope, just not as many people who realize that." <laughs> and that's true. I mean, look at look at the Hitler youth you had this last. Time. I mean, the, the one living in exile now. Really, you're going to say you're going to listen to that guy? I love him. <laughs> You love the criminal who <laughs> who spent decades protecting pedophile priests, and that's why they had to remove him from office. Yeah, but uh, you need to realize that I'm commanded to love everyone, right? But I love the popes in a special way. I do love the pedophile priests, by the way. I do love them. I wish them well. Okay, I don't, yeah. Um, you don't? Of course not. Okay. How can I love people who use lies and deceit and manipulate? You just told me that you never have ill will, you only have goodwill. Love is willing the good of the other, and you just told me now that you do not will the good of the pedophile priests. I said I do not like them. I don't like them either. I never said I like them. I said I love them. I'm commanded to love them. Well, and all you... I said was that I do not like them. Well, you said you do not love them, but you can change your mind. I'm happy to accept that. I don't love them either. Okay, you do not love them. Love would be an extreme version of like. If I don't like, then I obviously can't love. Your definition is arbitrary. The real definition of love is to will the good of the other. Otherwise, how could Jesus command us to love our enemies? That makes no sense. Love has to be the willing of the good of the other. It's a choice. And when I look up the definition of love, I get a strong affection for another rising out of kin, super personal tries, or an attraction based on sexual desire, or an affection based on admiration. So you have to do all that to your enemies? I can guarantee you that if you love your enemies according to Webster's Dictionary, you're going to be really messed up. I said that love is an extreme form of like and that I do not love them if I do if I don't like them I certainly don't love them which means I do not do the thing to my enemies that you you insist because you misunderstood what I said but do you want the best for everyone yes or no that's goodwill Did I say that I hate lies and liars and that that was my only exception Yeah All right then So you you don't only have goodwill then I did say that the only exception was that I hate lies and liars Yes Okay, so we can move on past this. So you enjoy your uh, work? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, it's every day you're doing uh, what podcasts or shows or what do you do? Uh, I do I do some educational videos. Uh, my wife and I uh, do a show, a series of videos where we're trying to um, teach middle school and high school science, unapologetically including certain forbidden concepts like deep time and evolution. And uh, I do a systematic classification of life series where I describe uh, phylogeny about the re various reasons why we belong to particular clades and what a clade is. I'm a director of the Phylogeny Explorer Project, which is an attempt to render the entire taxonomic tree of life as a navigable online encyclopedia of the whole tree of life. And um, we, we've been years on it, and we've got a couple of hundred people working on it uh, as well. And so I'm really proud to be involved in that project. And uh, otherwise, I do podcasts and interviews like this and uh, the occasional ponage video, which I've had the, the great fun of being able to do that for some. What is that? 
uh, Ponage is it, it, there's some hate preachers, and I like to get their videos and show how what they just said is wrong, and how we how that they, how we know for certain that what they said is wrong, and that the guy who said it knew that it was wrong when he said it, and how we know that. Okay. Why would someone like you come on to my show when I'm absolutely nobody? I've got very few listeners. Why would you take the time? I really appreciate it. Well, one, I would expect that you would appreciate it. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> and two, because, you know, I have a goal. If you tell me that you were an atheist once, upon, and I've, I've interviewed a few people like this, and, and the, it's, it's one thing when somebody tells me that they never had a, a religious belief and then they became religious. But when they tell me that they were an atheist and I can verify that they actually were an atheist, I mean, cause I know a couple of people that were actually activists, atheist activists once upon a time and then became Christians. Well, I'm very curious to talk to those people. Cause I want to know what was the reason, what convinced you? Cause you started out rationally thinking and then you adopted an irrational position. How did you do that? I went through solipsism. Exactly. So it's always a logical fallacy. There's never evidence to indicate the position. It's always fallacious. Yeah, I could be wrong, but if I am wrong, it doesn't really matter, right? You admit that much? No. No? You, you're, you're doing harm to yourself and your community by believing in lies. Okay, and how long does that harm last? It can harm you for the rest of your life. When I finally adopted full-on skepticism, when I realized that I had been duped all my life into believing all of this farcical nonsense, I mean, I was in my 30s. And I felt, and I know so many other people have said something similar, that all this time of their lives that they wasted believing things that weren't true. I do not want to believe a lie. Then why are you Catholic? Because I believe it's true. <laughs> what, you're believing a lie? Yeah, that's according to you, but I don't submit to you. You see what I mean? I, I know you don't submit to me, but the reality is, one way or another... You are believing teachings by people who don't know what they're talking about, expressing facts that are not facts, with knowledge they do not have. You need to understand that when I weigh your words of wisdom against 2,000 years worth of the words of wisdom of the saints, I am moved by the love of the saints and I'm stimulated rationally by the intellect of the saints more than you move me by your love. I'm not saying you don't have love, but I'm more moved by the love of the saints than I am by your love. And I'm more impressed by the intellect of the saints than I am by your intellect. I'm not saying you don't have an intellect, but I'm more impressed. If you don't believe me, if you think I'm lying, then you're just wrong. You're just wrong. No, I don't, I don't think you're aware that what you believe is a lie. You don't even know why it's a lie. That's the sad thing. If I could get you to understand why it's a lie, how to know for yourself that it's a lie. The only value information can have is how accurate you can show it to be. So if I walk into a church... My family did not take me to church as a child because it failed rather spectacularly the one time they did. When I told my mom that, you know, the guy behind the podium is lying, you know. You've, you've been on this trip for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> if you're telling me something you can't possibly know, and you're telling me as if you know it, I know better. There's no way you can know that. Mom, he's lying. And then I get slugged in the stomach to shut up because you don't question the guy behind the podium. Yeah, you probably have some deep trauma there. No, I don't have deep trauma. Okay, you probably. I, I, I no, I, I, I would say if I could have used the word blessed, <laughs> I would use it. I've, I've had, I've had a, I've had a good life. I've always, I've, I've never been rich, but I've always been happy. Yeah, and things have always been relatively good. And I think maybe I just have a positive outlook. Yeah, on things, I don't look at injustices against myself so much as I notice injustices against other people. And that's the ones that bother me. And I, mean, I, I know so many people in church who, whose lives are absolutely miserable, and they have to suffer through things that I honestly couldn't even endure. I've never had to suffer like that, like they have. Yeah. Are all Catholics equally repugnant to you, or do you have a favorite Catholic that you've met or that you've read about in history books? As I started out this conversation saying, I don't like to specify particular religions, much less denominations. Christianity and Islam are equal in my view. They are both evil. They're both lies. They are both used as justification for horrible crimes. You have no preference. I have no preference. I, but when you get into the Christian denominations, I can cite travesties by a number of them. But I got to admit that Catholicism, when you look at the map of just pure fucking evil, Catholicism's 
up there. They are the reigning king of the worst of the worst <laughs> that there can be. I mean, it's it's hard for me to imagine. I can try to imagine in, in my misunderstanding of Muslim religions, there, none of them compare or compete with Catholicism in how dark or evil or malicious they are and have always been since their inception. Nice cheery message. <laughs> It is, I think. <laughs> Thinking skeptically is the best thing that I can do for people. It's the best way to wake people up. And I've gotten plenty, plenty of, of positive messages in my inbox from people saying that they would, that I have shocked them into thinking. I had, I had just this year, I had somebody that was raised a Christian his whole life. He was completely dedicated to it. And he said that I shocked him out of his faith. Thank you. But I mean, I, I get, I get frequent messages like that, just not as explicit as this one was. Nice. Well, I really appreciate it. I think you're a nice guy. I think you're very boisterous, though, a little bit uh, rambunctious, yeah? Thank you. <laughs> Are you self-aware that you're a little bit gruff? Yeah, it, my, 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 my situation is if I say something is true, I had better be able to prove that it is true. And if I can't prove that it's true, I got no right to say that it's true. I, the best I can say is, well, I think so. Maybe I believe that. If I can show that it's true, then you know, there we go. But with religion, you just say it like it's true. And then you get 30,000 denominations all conflicting with each other, all saying that they have the absolute truth. <laughs> and every last one of them is a liar. <laughs> we'll leave it there. But thanks so much for taking the time. I really do appreciate it. And you can do your version of prayer for me, and I'll be doing my version of prayer for you, okay? Uh, I don't have a version of prayer. I mean, I'm sure you not do. Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks for taking the time, brother. I appreciate it. My pleasure. <laughs> at the end of my interviews I always ask my guests to give a positive message of hope to the listener you don't know who's listening it might be a Mormon might be a Catholic might be an atheist could be anyone what could you say to a random stranger that might be listening now faith is not trust you, you need two things to turn trust into faith you need a prefix and a suffix faith is a complete trust which is never wise and it is a complete trust that is not based on evidence you should never believe anything without question, without reason, without reservation. And that's what religion requires, because it is out to deceive you. If you like your worldview, if you think it's swell, if you've got some questions, ask me and I'll tell. All you've got to do is ask. All you've got to do is ask.